France threatens new sanctions against Israeli settlers. Haiti Transitional Council sworn in as gunshots ring out. Good afternoon and salam Lisa Madani. This is World Today and I'm Otto Othman. France is considering extending sanctions on Israeli settlers behind violence against Palestinian civilians in the occupied West Bank. President Emmanuel Macron's office said he spoke with Jordan's King Abdullah II regarding the matter. Since early this year, Israeli authorities have declared nearly 1,100 hectares of the West Bank to be state land. The status gives the Israeli government full control over how the land is used, inevitably leading it to be declared off-limits to Palestinians. Some 490,000 Israeli settlers now live in the West Bank alongside 3 million Palestinians. Macron and King Abdullah firmly condemned Israeli announcements about these settlements in the West Bank, which are contrary to international law. At least 488 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli troops or settlers in the West Bank since the Israel-Hamas war escalated on 7th October last year. Macron and King Abdullah also spoke about the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza and expressed great concern about the perspective of an Israeli offensive on Rafah, where more than 1.5 million people are seeking refuge and reiterated their opposition to such an operation. On a related note, the United Nations experts said Israel has reneged on its international obligations and called on immediate and unconditional arms and oil embargo into the country. Last month, UN Special Repertoire on the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Francesca Albanese, said Israel's military campaign in Gaza since 7th October amounted to genocide. Palestinians don't need charity and don't want charity. They want to have legal protection in order not to be put in a limbo where they are forgotten. And so again, I don't think that is just Egypt's responsibility, but it is to be known that there are Palestinian who have been displaced from the occupied Palestinian territory in Egypt, in Jordan, in Qatar, in other parts of the of the of the region. And uh, besides the immediate protection, um, humanitarian assistance, they will need legal protection. Someone is to deliver it. Albanese's remarks came during her visit to Cairo, following her visit in Jordan to monitor and report on the situation of Palestinians. Albanese, an Italian lawyer, is one of dozens of independent human rights experts mandated by the United Nations to report and advise on specific themes and crises. The U.S. military has begun construction on a pier meant to boost deliveries of desperately needed aid to Gaza. The small coastal territory has been devastated by more than six months of Israeli bombardment and ground operations, leaving the civilian population in need of humanitarian assistance to survive. Major General Pat Ryder said the pier is expected to be operational in early May and everything is on course. Highlighting the dangers in Gaza, Ryder said that some type of mortar attack caused minimal damage near an onshore area that will eventually be a delivery site for aid. The military official also outlined how the maritime aid delivery process will work. The assistance will first come into Cyprus where it will be screened and prepared for delivery. Aid will then be loaded onto commercial vessels for transportation to a floating platform miles off the coast of Gaza. Trucks will then drive the aid down the platform, where a distribution partner will take it into Gaza. The projected initial operating capacity will be 90 trucks of assistance per day, later rising to 150 trucks a day. The senior military official said there will be no U.S. military on the ground, saying an Israeli military unit will be responsible for anchoring the pier to the shore. 
Meanwhile, fresh clashes between police and students opposed to Israel's war in Gaza broke out yesterday, raising questions about the forceful methods being used to shut down protests that have intensified since mass arrests at Columbia University last week. Over the past two days, law enforcement at the behest of college administrators have deployed tasers and tear gas against protesters at Atlanta's Emory University, while officers clad in riot gear and mounted on horseback have swept away demonstrations at the University of Texas in Austin. At Columbia, the epicenter of the U.S. protest movement, university officials are locked in a stalemate with students over the removal of a tent encampment set up two weeks ago as a protest against the Israeli offensive. The administration, which has already allowed an initial deadline for an agreement with students to lapse, has given protesters until Friday to strike a deal. Other universities appeared determined to prevent similar long-run demonstrations to take root, opting to work with police to shut them down quickly and in some cases with force. Overall, more than 530 arrests have been made in the last week across major U.S. universities in relation to protests over Gaza. Denmark's government said it was adding 4.4 billion kron, equivalent to $630 million for military aid to its Ukraine and fund as Kiev pleads Western allies for more support against Russia's invasion. The fund was set up to distribute aid to Ukraine between last year and 2028 with the latest commitment bringing the total of military aid Denmark has pledged to $5.91 billion. Denmark has since the start of the war been one of the most active donor nations. The government listed previous aid supplied to Ukraine, such as artillery pieces and ammunition, missiles, tanks, drones and anti-air systems. It said the purpose of the fund was to continue to supply direct military support to Ukraine in the form of, among other things, weapons, other military equipment and training programs. Denmark, one of Ukraine's staunchest supporters, signed a 10-year security agreement with Ukraine at the end of February, following similar agreements between Kyiv and Berlin, London and Paris. According to the German-based Kiel Institute for the World Economy, Denmark is the fourth largest donor of military aid to Ukraine since the start of Russia's 2022 invasion. A long-awaited transitional ruling council was sworn in yesterday in Haiti, marking a critical step forward in restoring functional governments in a country rocked by months of gang violence. The Caribbean nation's embattled, unpopular and unelected Prime Minister Ariel Henry submitted his formal resignation as the new nine-member governing body was tasked with restoring a semblance of order. Mikhail Patrick Boisvat, the acting Prime Minister in the transnational phase, told the eight men and one woman who make up the new governing body that the swearing-in ceremony confers them the reins of the destiny of the nation and of the people. Bursts of automatic gunfire from gang members echoed through central Port-au-Prince and Delmas in the suburbs as the ceremony unfolded, a sign of just how much work lies ahead for the new authorities. Henry, who had promised in March to step down once the council was installed, as gangs rose up and demanded his ouster, thanked the Haitian people for the opportunity to serve the country. One of the council's first tasks will be to appoint a new full-fledged prime minister. Haiti has no functioning parliament and has not had a president since the assassination of Jovenel Moïse in 2021. Still ahead, over 100 inmates escape damaged Nigeria prison. Nearly 120 inmates escaped from a prison in central Nigeria after torrential rains destroyed the perimeter fence in Suleja, Nigeria. Adam Uduza, a spokesperson of the Nigerian Correctional Service, said the prison staff, along with other security personnel, were able to recapture 10 and a manhunt was underway for the rest. 
Duza blamed the dilapidated conditions of the colonial-era Nigerian prisons, which are old and weak for the incident. He said authorities were working to replace all aging facilities. The prison authorities appealed to the public to be on the lookout for the fleeing inmates and report to security personnel of any suspicious people. Jailbreaks are common in Nigeria's overcrowded prisons, where criminal gangs and separatists sometimes blast their way into detention facilities and free their imprisoned comrades. In one of the country's most audacious attacks, in July 2022, a group of people broke into Kuja security prison on the outskirts of Abuja with explosives and heavy guns, freeing more than 800 inmates, including more than 60 of their comrades. Guatemalan authorities raided the offices of the international organization Save the Children as part of an investigation into alleged abuses against minors. Now, Guatemalan authorities had sought assistance from prosecutors in the U.S. state of Texas, adding that the operation involved an inspection, search and seizure of evidence. The raid follows reports in local media that Guatemalan prosecutors asked the Texas Attorney General's Office for help in investigating alleged trafficking of Guatemalan children on the southern U.S. border. Save the Children has been working in Guatemala since a devastating earthquake in 1976 that left more than 2,000 people dead. It opened a permanent office there in 1983 and says it provides education, health, child protection and humanitarian aid, including to migrant children and their families who cross Guatemala's southern border. In a statement released last week, Save the Children denied the allegation, adding that they take all child safeguarding and misconduct allegations extremely seriously and have independent investigative mechanisms in place. The prosecutor's office sent a letter to the Texas Attorney General on 12 April claiming that Save the Children and several other NGOs were under suspicion of participating in a child trafficking operation. Spanish police, along with Mossos and Europol, dismantled the largest workshop of counterfeit two euro coins in Spain and the largest in Europe. The authorities seized nearly 400,000 fake coins from a criminal organization. Spain's National Police said it was the largest workshop in Spain producing two euro coins and the most important in Europe. Spanish police said they arrested 10 Chinese people since the beginning of the investigation and the dismantling of the manufacturing workshop located inside a warehouse in a municipality near Toledo. Police explained that the way to recognize fake coins was magnetism. Argentine jet fuel providers in Buenos Aires refused to service Cuban state airline Cubana this week, citing concerns over U.S. trade sanctions on Cuba, promoting multiple unexpected flight cancellations. Now, Cubana de Aviación SA said it had canceled flights on 23rd and 24th April, as well as other flights contracted to partner airlines, forcing the company to rebook passengers or provide refunds. Argentina's foreign ministry and office of the presidency did not immediately respond to a Reuters request for comment on the matter. Cubana's long-standing flights between Havana and Buenos Aires ran largely unfettered despite the sanctions under the administration of Argentina's leftist former president, Alberto Fernandez, who maintained close ties with Cuba. But Argentina's president, Javier Millet, a far-right liberation who took office on 10th December is an unbashedly pro-United States and has taken a cooler stance towards leftist trade partners in the region and overseas, including Brazil and China. Millions of people across South and Southeast Asia sweltered through unusually hot weather as the Thai government said heatstroke has already killed at least 30 people this year. A wave of exceptionally hot weather has blasted the region this week, prompting thousands of schools across the Philippines to suspend in-person classes. 
A minister in India, meanwhile, blamed hot weather after he fainted during an election campaign speech. As the country's weather bureau said severe heat wave conditions were expected in nine eastern and southern states in the coming days. Over in Thailand, city authorities in Bangkok gave an extreme heat warning as the heat index was expected to rise above 52 degrees Celsius. The health ministry said that 30 people had died from heat stroke between 1st January to 17th April, compared with 37 in the whole of 2023. Scientific research has shown climate change is causing the heat waves to be longer, more frequent and more intense. The United Nations said this week Asia was the region most affected by climate and weather hazards last year, with floods and storms the chief causes of casualties and economic losses. Meanwhile, the climate phenomenon known as El Nino and La Nina, which bring waves of heat, cold, rain or drought, will be more frequent and extreme in the coming years after South America suffered the most intense El Nino in decades. According to the Ecuador-based International Center for Research on the El Nino Phenomenon and the Peruvian Meteorology and Hydrology Agency, Senami, the recent El Nino was among the five strongest since 1950. El Nino and La Nina hit different parts of the world distinctly. In Latin America, they have affected crops such as wheat, soy and corn, damaging regional economies often highly dependent on farming. Temperatures are estimated to be above normal in much of South America, but expected to be below normal on the coast of Ecuador, northern Peru, and southern Argentina, as well as in Chile. With the recent El Nino, Peru had the warmest winter in the last 60 years, while in Colombia, temperatures reached records in different parts of the country. Argentina and Chile saw more rain, which is the former helped soy and corn production after a drought the year before. Spaceship carrying three astronauts from China's Shenzhou 18 mission safely docked at Tiangong Space Station today, the latest step in Beijing's space program that aims to send astronauts to the moon by 2030. The crew took off at a capsule atop a Long March 2F rocket from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in China's northwest at 8.59 p.m. local time yesterday. The mission is led by Yi Guanfu, a fighter pilot and astronaut who was previously part of the Shenzhou 13 crew in 2021. He is joined by astronauts Li Kong and Li Guangzhu, who are heading into space for the first time. The astronauts will stay at the Tiangong Space Station for six months. There, they plan to carry out experiments in the fields of basic physics in microgravity, space material science, space life science, space medicine and space technology. They will also try and create an aquarium on board and seek to raise fish in zero gravity. The new crew will replace the Shenzhou 17 team who were sent to the station in October. The world's second largest economy has pumped billions of dollars into its space program in an effort to catch up with the United States and Russia. Beijing also aims to send a crewed mission to the moon by 2030 and plans to build a base on the lunar surface. Japanese auto giant Honda will invest $11 billion for a new massive, uh, massive new electric vehicle EV battery and assembly plant in Canada. Now, Honda Chief Executive Officer Toshihiro Mibe told a joint news conference with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and other officials that EVs will start rolling off the new assembly line in 2028. Once fully operational, the factory will have a production capacity of 240,000 vehicles per year and a battery's output of 36 gigawatt hours per year. Honda estimates that 1,000 new jobs will be created at the facility, which is to be built next to its existing Civic and CRV assembly plants north of Toronto that already employ 4,200 workers. Honda is making Canadian automotive history. With this announcement, 
we will be investing to create Canada's first comprehensive electric vehicle supply chain from start to finish. Trudeau also described Honda's investment will position Canada as a destination for electric vehicle investment with tax incentives, renewable energy access and its rare mineral deposits. Next up in sports, Manchester City humble Brighton to keep pressure on Arsenal. Kicking off our segment, sports segment with football. Phil Foden struck twice as Manchester City stepped up their bid for a fourth Premier League crown in a row with a ruthless 4-0 victory at Brighton and Hove Albion. A day after Liverpool's title challenge suffered a huge blow with a 2-0 defeat at Everton, City kept up the pressure on leaders Arsenal with a dominant display that left them one point behind the London club with the game in hand. Kevin De Bruyne's superb diving header put City missing top scorer Erling Haaland due to injury ahead in the 17th minute. Foden scored his first with a deflected free kick and Brighton defensive errors allowed Bernardo Silva to win the ball and set up the England midfielder to sweep a shot into the bottom corner before half-time. Julian Alvarez completed the route midway through the second half and Brighton, remained 11th in the table, never looked capable of launching a fight back. Brighton's best chance came when City keeper Ederson gifted them a late opportunity when he raced out of his box only to fire the ball straight at Odeluga Ofia, who failed to take advantage. Manchester City are unbeaten in 30 games in all competitions with 24 wins and 6 draws. Meanwhile, over in Riyadh, third place Al Ahli fell 2-1 on the road away to relegation battling Al Riyadh in the Saudi Pro League early today. Malian midfielder Birama Trope put the host up from the penalty spot in the 43rd minute after Zimbabwean forward Knowledge Musona was stripped up in the box. Former Barcelona and Milan midfielder Frank Kessi drew the visitors level in the first half stoppage time but a late winner from Saudi midfielder Abu Hadi Al Harajin, six minutes from full time, ensured all three points would stay in Riyadh. The result sees Al Riyadh move up into 14th place in the standings on 28 points, three clear of the drop zone, while Matthias Geisler's side remain two points ahead of Jeddah rivals Al Ittihad in fourth and 16 points behind second place Al Nasser. Saudi Arabia's state oil giant Aramco and world football governing body FIFA announced a major sponsorship agreement until the end of 2027. Now, the deal is the latest high-profile investment in global sports for Saudi Arabia, who have already been confirmed as the only bid for the 2034 World Cup. In a joint statement, it was confirmed Aramco would become FIFA's major worldwide partner exclusive in the energy category. The deal involves sponsorship rights for multiple events, including the 2026 Men's World Cup and the Women's World Cup the following year. FIFA President Gianni Infantino said the partnership will assist FIFA to successfully deliver its flagship tournaments over the next four years and as is the case with all its commercial agreements, enable it to provide enhanced support to 211 FIFA member associations across the globe. He added Aramco has a strong track record of supporting world-class events and also a focus on developing grassroots sports initiatives. It is the latest high-profile lucrative sporting pact by the West Asian country. Premier League club Newcastle United and Live Golf are financed through the Saudi Public Investment Fund, a sovereign wealth vehicle which is also pouring money into making the Saudi Pro League a destination of choice for players. The Rafael Nadal thrashed 16-year-old wildcard Darwin Blanche 6-1-6 love in the first round of the Madrid Open and will face Australian 10th seed Alex de Menor next. The 22-time Grand Slam champion broke the American at the first opportunity in this second game, was playing his first tournament since January. 
In the women's singles, world number one, Iga Shvitek beat Wang Ziyu 6164 to reach the third round of the Madrid Open as she bids to win the competition for the first time. Coco Gauff, meanwhile, sealed through the third round with a six love, six love thumping of Aranza Ross. Swiatek bounced back from her semi-final defeat by Elena Ribakina in Stuttgart with a comfortable straight sets victory. The pole wobbled in the second set as Wang won three games in a row but recovered to triumph in one hour and 16 minutes. Madrid is the only major European clay tournament that Swiatek has yet to win. Swiatek coasted through the first set, breaking twice for a four-love lead. She wrapped it up with another break, leaving Wang with no chance of reaching her red-hot backhand return. The Doha and Indian Wells winner took a 4-1 lead in the second set, but Wang fought her way back in for 4-all before the top seed steeled herself to hold. Wang then handed the second set on the plate to Switek with a two double faults. And the pole will face 27th seed Sorana Cristia in the third round. Earlier, Goff earned the first double bagel victory of her career in a WTA Tour main draw event in only 51 minutes against her 33-year-old Dutch opponent, Ross. The American saved four break points in the match to become the third player ever to win 6-love, six 6-love six in the Madrid Open main draw. World number three, Goff will next face Ukraine's Diana Yastremska. Johanan Badminton Fellow Thomas dan Uber Changdu 2024 Sabtu 27 April Saksikan juga secara penstreaman langsung di RTM Click. And that wraps up World Today. In our top story, France threatens new sanctions against Israeli settlers. Tune in to Malaysia Tonight, coming up at 8.30pm on TV1 and Saluran Brita RTM. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'm Otto Othman. Thanks for watching and have a pleasant day ahead.